And one of the things that's just baffling is the number of fertilizers that are available to you as a grower. Whether they're conventional fertilizers or organic fertilizers, it's just totally baffling how much you've got. There's also a lot of different fertilizer systems and it's hard to just cover the, the generic systems in one lecture. Um, the thing is, if you also need to think about is if you're going to do a continuous feed or a slow release feed, because there's other ways to think about when we do a slow release. You need to worry about the salt content to your water and you also need to make sure that you match good periods of growth and of course always you want to, to decrease the amount of waste that fertilizer you're generating. It doesn't, doesn't pay you anything to, to fertilize a crop when it goes through the pot and out the drain. That's a waste of money and it's also a pollutant. Pre-plant fertilization includes basically dolomitic limestone, superphosphate, micronutrients, maybe a starter charge of, of nitrogen and potassium. The other thing to think about with a pre-plant incorporation is to think about maybe this is some, if you want to apply some organic compounds, some organic fertilizers. And what the organic fertilizers do in a pre-plant program is they're slowly available because they're not in the salt form. They're usually bound up in some sort of a complex or something like that or a chelator. So Dolomitic limestone, uh, it just depends on how much peat, you, peat moss you have in the system uh, for your pH adjustment. You need to monitor your magnesium and these sorts of things. Treble superphosphate versus simple superphosphate. They both cost the same amount of money pound for pound. Treble superphosphate is faster, more quickly available. So you'll use that on a crop with high turnaround. Simple superphosphate is a slow, more slowly available. So you, have, you use that for a longer term class, longer term crop. And then of course your micronutrients. So typically for pre-plant nutrients, most people add calcium and magnesium or your phosphates. And that's, that's pretty much the standard. Um, these fertilizers you'll put in the system, you put these system in prior to steaming or steam pasteurization. Um, one thing that you don't want to do is add a, a product like Osmocote or some of your sulfur-coated ureas or something like that pre-steam because the steaming process will completely erode the slow release properties of that fertilizer. You'll get a, a, almost a salt burn or the fertilizer just goes away. Osmocote is actually uh, so temperature sensitive that if you put it in a hot pot on your front <coughs> patio, you'll get a spike of fertilizer and it won't last very long. So, um, how hot? Oh, 85 degrees. So. How often you're going to feed depends on your, how deg your degree of sophistication, <laughs> what you're looking for, once per week, 240 to 700, every f irrigation. It just depends on what you want. Is there a right way and a wrong way? Not really. Again, I want to stress avoid fertilizer waste. <coughs> Don't put on more fertilizer than your plants are going to use. We used to, the Fertilizer companies used to tell their greenhouse growers, as soon as you transplant your plants, start fertilizing. The roots haven't even gotten out. Now, the plants will never be hungry because the there will be some fertilizer there when the roots do get out, but where did the most of the fertilizer go? Down the drain. Down the drain. Waste of money and it's a major pollutant. So I typically don't like to have my growers, or one of the things I'd like you to take <coughs> home with you, is don't fertilize and don't start fertilizing until you have roots. So I like to wait until the roots hit the side of the pot, then start adding fertilizer. Yes. Is that what causes the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico? Is that what causes dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico? Yes, but it's mostly agricultural. <coughs> but it's not just um, fertilizer waste. It's also uh, eutrophication and also lack of oxygen from siltation. What we have done in our culture is we have dredged and dredged and dredged and dredged to maintain traffic in at the mouth of the Mississippi River so the barge traffic can continue. So we have open transport and because of that we have opened up and sped up the speed of the water that leaves 
the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and causes <coughs> lack of oxygen. We have removed the mangrove barriers, the swamps and such as that, which is also which contributed to the devastation of the Hurricane Katrina. Uh, there's a book you should read, it's called um, Oh, I have to think about it, but it's a, uh, it's a history of the Mississippi <coughs> River. So, um, and it was written before Katrina. Did I see another hand up? Okay. And gr remember the ratios that we want to have. <coughs> now, in the old days, we still put potting soil, or put, put uh, topsoil in our fertilizers. Uh, we use a lot of ammoniacal fertilizers just to keep the pH down. If you need to drive your pH down, if your pH is too high in your potting soil, if you have a highly alkaline water and you're getting excessive pH rate increases, you can apply acid forming fertilizers to drive the pH down. That's called management. But typically, in greenhouse crops, we use 100% nitrates, especially in plugs, because what it does, it grows a harder <coughs> plant. It's not as deep green foliage. Um, it uh, gives us a, a stronger, shorter stature, a stronger plant. Question? Does silicone help that out? Uh, I've seen some people say Kay. yes, some people say no. OK, does silicone add to the hardiness of a plant? In the textbook, silicone, silicone is not an essential element. However, unless you're rice, silicone is an essential element in rice. Because most of your graminase species take up silicon to support the cell, cell, the cell wall strength of a stem. And it prevents loging or lo in, of fall in, where the seedling stalk will fall into the water and the seedling stalk rots, therefore it can't complete its life cycle. What does silicone do? Sil some people applied silicone fertilizers to um, increase that hardiness of a plant. Um, there's not a lot of research out on that, um, but most of the research that I have read points to, the, a, points to yes. The most fascinating research I have seen is using silicone fertilizers to stop leaf miner damage. Because the silicone, the leaf miners don't like tunneling through high silicon foliage. Most dicots don't readily take up silicone unless it's in a form that they can take it up as a salt. Because if, if you grew your plants in sand, which has got a lot of silica, they're not going to take up that silica. So. So the old fertilizers, we used triple 20. <coughs> but if we use these older fertilizers, 20, 20, 20, in a soil-less mix, the pH is going to go way, way down. And I have, many of us in the academic world have be literally begged the fertilizer companies to stop selling this product under the name General Greenhouse Fertilizer. Because every starting greenhouse grower with no education starts with this fertilizer, calls me on the phone, and I say use 20, 10, 20. Well, that's not general greenhouse fertilizer. And I said, I know. It was in the 60s. And the modern fertilizers like 15,5 CalMag, 15,5, 15, these are the products that we're using today. Ammonium toxicity is a, more of a problem in the um, wintertime. Of course, you need to know what your, your fertilizers are what your media are, pine bark versus core versus peat moss. Your plant demands are good for nutrients are going to change. For instance, a hydroponic grower in the winter months uses a higher fertilizer concentration than in the summer months. Why would that be? Because of transpiration. Because of transpiration rates. It's moving more water through the system more quickly in the summertime. So use a lower concentration <laughs> to get the same volume of fertilizer into the system. Exactly. 
which gets us to a topic that we call chemigation or fertigation. And we use fertigation in our greenhouse systems because it's easier to get applier fertilizers through the irrigation water. And we use an injector. And injectors come in many different sizes, shapes, or form. And basically, an injector is a device that'll take a concentrated form, our fertilizer concentrate. We have clear water coming into the system, mixes the concentrate in with the water, make a dilute fertilizer, and send it to the plants. And basically how it works. Now our proportion direct uh, injectors, we usually call them a chemical dosing proportioner. And there are lots of different kinds. Uh, you'll get anything, they're usually, if it's a 2% injector, it's actually 1 to 50. In other words, for every part of concentrate it picks up, it puts out 50 parts of blend. 1%, a half percent, 2%. Notice that the percentages goes down as the ratio increases. So just to give you an example, one part concentrate, 99 parts water, contributes 100 parts, that's a 1 to 100 injector. Pretty simple. We'll see if you think it's so simple next week in lab when I ask you to calculate it. Kinds of injectors that we have. Like I said, they're all different kinds. They have, they have place everywhere. The common ones are Venturi injectors and what we call positive displacement injectors. The Venturi injectors, things like Hoson, Siphon-X, Siphon-Hose, positive displacement, Dositron, these are just brand names. The Venturi injector is the simplest and least expensive injector we can use. It has no moving parts, <coughs> it injects at one rate, it's inexpensive, and the way it works is we take a, the water, fresh water comes in this way, creates a chamber in this Venturi chamber where we have a constriction of airflow, we cons or not a constrict, we have a constriction of water flow where it constricts, it speeds up. And when it speeds up, there's a little orifice right here which is uh, basically a small hole and is connected to the tube and the tube is connected to, is in a fertilizer concentrate and it draws the concentrate up through the tube and blends with the fertilizer, goes to the plant. It's very, very simple. Works on the same concept that a carburetor on an engine works. We now have fuel injectors, um, but you still have carburetors on small engines and such as that. Question. <coughs> it's the water pressure, it pulls the water, it's actually a vacuum. It draws the water up and we're creating a, sm a slight vacuum in the center part. Okay. You say it's not accurate. They're not that accurate. They're, most of them are um, 1 to 16 one gallon to 16 or one to 32. They're very accurate the day you take them out of the box, but over time they lose accuracy. Um, there's some deviation in accuracy depending on the water pressure, because one of the big problems with these is the loss of water pressure, because we have a, a, where the water comes in, we have high degree of water pressure when the water comes out. Because it's lost so much in this constriction, the water pressure is reduced. I will tell you that some of the most sophisticated and most successful greenhouse growers I have ever seen, this is as high tech of a fertilizer system as they'll ever use. Because all it takes is a siphon hose hooked up to your spigot, carry a five gallon bucket with your fertilizer and that's all you need. It's all I use at home. It works very, very well. You say there's a loss of pressure on that outflow? There is a, a, there is a 
a, a lot, a, a strategic, uh, an increased loss of pressure at the outflow. That's does correct. It really that much? Well, it does. It, it does matter. And what a lot of people will do is they use a smaller breaker nozzle at the end of the hose, so they get an efficient breaker uh, breaker pattern in the water. So, yeah. You're going to do. You you need to. Typically, most siphon hose systems don't work anything further than 50 feet of hose. So you got to mix your thing, put it in another tank. You got to carry it with you. you you're not going to have more than 50 feet between a siphon hose, and so forth. Here's an. This is like this is the one I use at home, and uh, typically speaking. You're going to use it for um, spot checks or small greenhouse sections. Uh, one of the things that people can use these for is you can use these for uh, applying a fungicide or something like that. They work very, very effectively that way. They're cheap. They have no moving parts. They're flexible. They can use them with a lot of different things. They're portable. When they wear out, you throw them away. They do wear out. How often? How often? Uh, probably, t I throw them away about every ten years. I mean, it's, they like you lose them before you throw them away. Usually, uh, back pressure valve. You got to if if you're hooked to you need to put a back pressure you need to put a an air gap separation backflow device and it's just a little screw on thing to make sure you don't contaminate water system. Um, they recommend 50, no more than 50 feet to the hose end. I, you, I've stretched it as far as 100, and you're going to get about uh, a pretty major water loss. We talked about this in uh, class today, in lab today, but uh, positive displacement injectors. Uh, there's all different kinds of positive displacement injectors, and what that refers to is we're using a water pump or an electric pump, and it's a series of valves and. This is a schematic of what we saw in the dosematic, where the water flow comes in and the water actually powers the pump, and it uh, water and fertilizer. The advantage of this is that is the the water pressure, the water flow, uh, typically is the power source, and uh, many of these have uh, adjustable injection ratios. And the major limitation is just how big they are. This is a an old style. It's a, called a Smith uh, Smith. Um, injector, uh, measure mix. Um, you'll still see them in the industry and they still manufacture. And this is a, uh, an injector that's made out of bronze. Um, it's very rugged. Um, there's other brands that are made out of uh, cast metal and stainless steel. When you get into the, uh, the bronze type injectors such as this one, they're typically factory set at one particular ratio. And you really don't have an op opportunity to adjust them. So if you had to make an adjustment um, based upon being worn out or out of adjustment or something, you'd have to make the adjustment in your actual fertilizer mixing itself. But these are very reliable, and you'll see these used in a lot of different greenhouses um, well, where they'll either permanently mount it with a fertilizer system for one crop, um, or they'll use it uh, on a cart or something like that. But they, this particular one is a dual head injector, and what it allows us is to take two different fertilizer tanks and blend those. Maybe these fertilizers are not compatible in the same concentration mix and blends them together for further injection down the line. The most common ones are the, uh, the polymer construction like the Dosomatic or the Dosatron. Um, there are other brands out there, but these are the, the primary ones. We typically install these in line this particular inline installation, you can see I have a little check valve here, this one side. That prevents water from flowing back. It won't isolate, this is not a check valve that will isolate a drinking water supply from uh, the fertilizer system, but it basically prevents water from going backwards and uh, keeping our water direction in the way we want. Uh, you can mount them in line to increase your uh, concentrations or have dual, dual injection systems. One of the things that I uh, typically do when I install an injection system is I put in a bypass uh, where I can bypass and do fresh water irrigation. Um, however, 
It's just as easy to do freshwater irrigation by pulling the fertilizer tube out of the bucket. Uh, that works too. Um, and another little trick that if you've ever done any plumbing at all, I like to put in um, uh, couplers so I can take the thing apart without having to cut the pipe. These are the dose of, uh, this is the dosmatic system. And th we have three dosmatics installed on this, this particular system here in that we're feeding a very large volume line. It's typically e cheaper to install several of these polymer injectors rather than a big major injector for a high velocity line. So it's typically a more I inexpensive system to install. Another uh, brand out there is called Anderson Ratio, Ratio Feeder. These are the single head uh, feeding systems where we'll buy a unit uh, and put it together in a modular system for um, custom designing for a specific application. Question? Uh, back to the dosematics. Um, how, so you can, you can do a 1 to 100, 1 to 200. How low can that second number go? Can how low can that second number go? Um, it can go. Um, you can open up. It depends on how you buy this, the specifications in which you buy. Uh, they come in different uh, different systems. The uh, Anderson injection system is a modular system. Uh, the Anderson heads are. Right here in this particular design, we have a metering pump here. And that metering pump meters the, the either it's set on electrical conductivity or attached to something like that. So it gives us a little bit more precision. And so forth. All right, so the Anderson uh, ratio feeder system, these are eas more easily automated uh, with a co computer control system than the dosomatics. The dosomatics are not, you can't really automate those except maybe turn a valve on or off or s measured with electrical conductivity sensor or something like that. But uh, the Anderson electrode, uh, the Anderson system has, uh, we can put in electrodes that sense the electrical conductivity of the pH and it can adjust um, the injector head, how much it's, it's uh, putting into the system with the mixing tank and so forth. So that's one of the advantages of the Anderson system is it can be controlled by pH and electrical conductivity with more precision. You have it on the water flowing out. If you were recycling the water, would you want to put it on the water flowing in? Okay, if I was recycling the water and I wanted to know what it, I would put it on the water flow out and on the water flow in. I would want to know with electrical conductivity, the materials coming in, what yeah. point we're at to know how much is there. But actually, I'm still going to adjust this uh, system on the output because the output is what's going to really tell me what the final product is. It's going to be adjusting itself to the, cr the electrical conductivity that's in the water system there. Now the in issue with electrical conductivity in these devices is we're basing it on the total salt load, maybe not on the individual ions that are in the system. The Anderson injection system can be adapted with an ion-specific electrode and programmed in as such. So on the water out, the number's off, but it's too late to do anything. The water out, we can make it consistent because the water coming back into the system for recirculation typically is going to be more dilute because the plants have already taken it up. So I'm going to be adding more fertilizer to it. What I want is a uniform feed coming out of the injector system. And so it will adapt to how much fertilizer is in the water, how much has been used, etc. But what they'll do typically when they set these up is they'll design a system to back blend raw water to maintain a consistent 
uh, uh, constant feed system so that it's all uniform. And here's a picture up in the top of the um, of the uh, ratio feeder, and this is uh, one that is, is mounted that you can control independently, or it could be connected to a computer monitoring system. So, and th they make these uh, primarily. Most people buy them with either pH or electrical conductivity, but they can make them with specific ions as well. Are they more expensive? Yes, they're much more expensive. However, um, you get what you pay for. If you need more precision, the Anderson injection system is the way to go. That Anderson injection system uh, is what they use at Gully Greenhouses. And that photograph was taken at Gully Greenhouses. So they find this to be what they need for their precision in their plug production. Where a lot of people use the dosimatics, where they'll have those with single, they'll uh, change, they have more different crops that have different fertilizer requirements and quite often all I have to do is just switch out the bucket. Like for instance, when we go to Tagawa greenhouses, you'll see that they have a green bucket, red bucket, and a blue bucket. And they tell their employees, for this particular crop on this day, use the blue bucket or the green bucket. So they've got everything pretty much to the point where the, the, the worker doesn't really know what's in the bucket other than fertilizer and it's the grower that knows what the concentration is based upon. They have everything color coded. So, when you have permanently inline fixed systems such as the Andersons, you have less flexibility. But if you have a consistent demand for one crop, it works very well. Another injector technology uh, in the positive displacement uh, system, and this is one that has no moving parts. This is called um, a uh, Giwa injector, that's a brand name. And this is a pressurized bladder. And we have a steel tank. And we have a pressurized, bl we have a bladder, a polyethylene bladder on the inside of the chamber. And we fill it with our fertilizer solution. And the water flows into the system. And as it flows into the system, uh, a percentage of the water pressurizes the chamber, which pushes pressure against the bladder. And then that pressure pushes the fertilizer up through a tube into a venturi vortex and it flows out. So uh, this is a type of venturi system that doesn't require any moving parts, but yet it doesn't reduce the water pressure uh, significantly as it flows out. Uh, these are quite regularly used in situations where we have very little water power. Um, it does um, require a good bit of water pressure for it to work. Um, one of the things I'll, this is a pressurized system. It's got a little, a couple little watch glasses, watch where you can see whether or not you got fertilizer in your bladder or not. Um, one of the things to note, it's just got a drain valve at the bottom to let the water out when you need to change the fertilizer because if you open that top up and it's pressurized, open the top here, you'll get a face full of fertilizer and uh, one of my early experiences was cleaning one of these out and it opened it up pressurized. I'm glad I had glasses on. And Peter's fertilizer is blue and I had white eyes and blue face for two days. So it was fun to go to class. Which injector is the right injector for you? Well, it's based on what you need. How big of an operation you have. Um, Larger greenhouses typically go with a permanent installation. Um, small units or small greenhouses. If you have lots of different uh, crops that have lots of different fertilizer regimes, again, you may want to choose a smaller system so you can make it mobile or portable. Another thing you need to think about is um, are you going to expand? What's your water flow rate? What's your injector rate that you want? How much water pressure you have? How good is your water quality? Um, some of these injectors don't work well unless you have filtered water, if you're using pond water or something like that. You also need to think about what chemistry you're injecting. And um, because not all fertilizers or not all injectors are capable to handle um, all the chemistry that we're using in a greenhouse. Um, 
One of the things that I think about a lot when I order a product is manufacturer support. This is a mechanical device. They do wear out and you do they have replaceable parts that are easy to get. A repair kit for a Dosatron injector is about 50 to 60 bucks and it's basically a couple handful of the pieces that wear out regularly plus O-rings and um, such as that. Think about how you're going to put your injector in uh, with bypass systems. Um, open and close, you can check valves, put it in line, in series, parallel. Um, I typically, most of the installations I've ever done have been a combination of the bypass and the series. That's what works best for me. Um, the, um, some people prefer this system um, where we have parallel. It really depends on what you're working with. This is a table uh, published by Soil and Plant Labs out of uh, Orange, California that they use for um, fertilizer compatibility. And not all fertilizers can be mixed in concentrate form. For instance, uh, magnesium sulfate and calcium nitrate are two fertilizers that are not compatible in concentrated form. We, if you were to blend concentrated form of magnesium sulfate and calcium nitrate, can you imagine what would happen to your fertilizer tank? No, it would not explode. No. What it would do is the calcium has a high affinity for the sulfate anion, and they join together, drift to the bottom into a sludge we call gypsum. In other words, you put those two fertilizers together and you have a tank full of drywall. Doesn't inject very well. So we don't put those, those together. There are some that are somewhat uh, explosive, but most of them are more preci they precipitate out. Another thing to remember is that fertilizers, when we mix them into a solution, fertilizers are salts. And when you, blend, when you start dissolving a salt into water, what is the reaction typically? Is it endothermic or exothermic? Exothermic, exothermic means what? generates heat. You're 100%, 180 degrees off. It's an endothermic reaction and it gets cold. Have you ever made ice cream? We put salt in the ice cream not to drop the temperature of the water, but actually to use the chemical reaction of the salt in the water to make the water colder, ice water colder. And, and since it's got salt in it, it can go below f uh, the standard water freezing point and make tasty ice cream. Okay? Unless you spill the salt into the, salt into the ice cream. And I don't know if anybody's ever had ice cream made with uh, liquid nitrogen. That's cool. Fun stuff. It's fun stuff. Okay. So it gets cold. So one of the things to think about is fertilizers, when you're working concentrated form, it's hard to dissolve and it's best to start with hot water. It dissolves faster. Chemicals to be injected. Um, this is an acid injection module and it's designed for uh, injecting sulfuric acid and it's attached to a pH controller. And this pr these particular units, when you're getting specific ions and specific injection modules, they're much, much, much more expensive. For instance, that little guy right there is $1,000. But if you're injecting acid, you have to have an injector that will inject acid. Other things you need to think about, this is a certified backflow prevention system. And this particular greenhouse has it mounted on the fresh water supply from the domestic utility source. These are required in greenhouses that inject fertilizers and pesticides and other chemicals into their irrigation water. Not because of what we're doing, but because of whom? Because of that contractor down the street that decides to dig a trench without a permit and cuts the water line and when the water line pressure drops the water flows back out of the greenhouse sucks up the fertilizer out of the bucket and contaminates the water supply. So we're actually planning ahead for that silly contractor but we would get blamed. Filtration is important <coughs> Injectors don't work well 
with lots of suspended solids. Now, of course, the suspended solids is important too. If it's sand and grit, it's going to tear the injector up. But if it's uh, if we're injecting a organic fertilizer that's got a lot of suspended solids in it, a lot of those things don't inject well. Filtration. This is a, a filtration system on a on a pond supply for a nursery. Um, it's very important. This morning we talked a little bit about water hammer. Water hammer is that condition where we have water flowing in in one particular direction as we're using more and more quarter turn valves or solenoid valves with instant on, instant off, where 80 pounds per square inch is coming at that valve. We turn it off, the water hits that valve and turns around and comes back. So we have 80 pounds plus 80 pounds equals 160 pounds, and we have a condition called water hammer. And you've all heard this in, in your apartments or when the, the dishwasher turns on or off or something like this, and you get that, those pipes clanking. Well, that's called water hammer. A lot of our injectors, especially the polymer injectors, they fatigue over time with this constant hammering on the product, and also they're exposed to sun, and they get brittle. So one of the things I always in install is a water hammer arrester. And basically what this is is just a bladder that has a little air pressurized air chamber in there and it just takes in it's like a little shock absorber in the system um, so the hammer arresters I always put them on between the valve and uh, the valve and the injector on that side so that we can have good control if you put it on the other side it still works but I want I'm trying to protect the injector um, so these are important things to get. And this particular water hammer arrester, it's got a three quarter inch pipe thread. It, um, you can get it at Granger Supply for about $30. Um, or you can get um, water hammer arresters for a hot water heater at any hardware store for under $20. It's not a major investment to, peck, to protect a $400 injector. Um, they require adjusting and calibration. Um, here we, we can see a, a bypass system installed um, with three different tanks. Uh, we've got a filtration system here with a flush line. Um, so forth. And to volume ratio calibration method, we demonstrated this class today where you take a graduated cylinder and a known volume like a five gallon bucket it's not something that takes a lot of uh, effort to do, um, and it's something that should be done on a regular basis to make sure your equipment is working correctly. We talked about injection ratios, volumes, um, calibration, like 1 to 51, particular, this particular one, quick 75 method. What is the part per million? And the quick 75 method, the question was asked this morning, where does the quick 75 come from? Well, if you take 100 gallons of water and multiply that times 8.34, because it's 8.34 pounds per gallon. So it's 100 gallons, 834 pounds. Multiply 834 times 16, because there's 16 ounces in a pound. That means we have 13,344 ounces per 100 gallons, or 13,344,000,000 ounces equals one part per million, and or 0 0.01 ounces per 100 gallons for one part per million. And that's where the quick 75 method comes from, is we just back calculate that, and it comes out actually comes out to 74.95. So, 94, excuse me. So that's where that quick 75 method comes from. Um, it's not exact, but it's exact within a tenth of an ounce. So, so once you understand this, you understand how to put together your fertilizer mixes.
However, not everybody likes to do the math. And most of the standard greenhouse fertilizers come with a table and it tells you how, what percent nitrogen you want in your fertilizer, what kind of injector you're using, whether it's 1 to 12, 1 to 100, or 1 to 200, and you can read that off the bag if the bag's label hasn't been wetted to the point where you can't read it anymore. So I'd like you guys to know how to do this. And I typically like you to learn how to do this in your head because when you, bend, you put the calculator in your shirt pocket and you bend over the bucket and your calculator drops into the fertilizer tank, fertilizer water is not very good for, fer for calculators, so. Not too much. Hmm? Yeah, my, yes. All right, acid injection. And uh, two weeks ago you worked with, uh, you did the demonstration with acid injection. And we acidify our water, uh, we inject acid in the water to neutralize the alkalinity. Um, for some reason, this is a difficult concept for a lot of greenhouse growers to understand, is they think we're injecting acid to lower the pH of the water. That's not correct. I'm injecting acid to remove the alkalinity in the water. And the pH is not changed drastically. Because what we're doing is we're taking that carbonate, hydrogen ion from an acid, introducing it to the carbonate in the water, and it generates CO2 and clean water. And all it's really doing is removing the carbonate as an acid, I mean as a carbon dioxide gas. So it neutralizes the alkalinity, it doesn't change the pH. The acids that we commonly use are sulfuric, nitric, phosphoric, and citric. These are the acids that are primarily used in the greenhouse industry today. Now, which acid to use? Which acid to use? Sulfuric acid is the cheapest, by and far, the cheapest acid you can buy, the most readily available. You can buy 35% sulfuric acid just about every community in the United States. Where would you shop? Where's that? I'd go to Napa. Napa store. It's battery acid. Okay? Of course, more and more batteries are closed cell. Or we can go to Boeing and get a uh, lithium explosive battery. Right. Okay. So sulfuric acid, but you can also get sulfuric acid delivered to your site. Um, Van Waters and Rogers sells 98 Balmé acid in 55 gallon drums, 98% sulfuric acid, but be prepared to handle a serious acid. Nitric acid, some growers like to use nitric acid because it's got a nitrate uh, anion, okay? Rather than a sulfate anion. However, the volume of nitrogen that we're getting out of our acidification process probably isn't that good because this is a fuming acid. And fuming acids, I don't know if you remember working with nitric acid in chemistry lab, you probably weren't a happy camper because it smells bad and it leaves nice little yellow stains on your fingers and uh, you guys are better in the labs than I am. Phosphoric acid is also easy to come by. Uh, it's, uh, typically we use food grade phosphoric acid. It's used commonly in uh, lots of food processing. However, Oftentimes, to generate the volume of phosphoric acid that we need in our system, we're going to mess up our phosphate to nitrogen to potassium ratio. So to use phosphoric acid, you need to also use a soil, a wa soil and water test. And it's also more expensive than both sulfuric and nitric. Citric acid, why would we use citric acid? Citric acid is organic. Even a food grade citric acid that is not considered organic, we use citric acid as a water treatment. It's generally accepted as organic. Um, food grade citric acid, you can get it in a, in a granular form or you get a liquid form. Uh, most of the liquid form citric acid that's sold in Colorado is, is used on the poultry farms for acidifying the water for the absorption of vitamins and um, drugs in the uh, irrigation water. Uh, citric acid is uh, very easy to use, however, it's very expensive. That's, but it's not as expensive as phosphoric. However, if you have an organic customer, 
you have to acidify your water, you usually are going to demand a higher value for your crop and it justifies the use of the more expensive acidification process to be able to get the organic certification. I would use citric acid in a heartbeat. You need to think of how easy it is to use, how safe, what the cost is, nutrient injection, but more than anything else, is it available? And so forth. We used to, with our, our um, organophosphate pesticides, we used to uh, bring the pH down on our organic phosphate pesticides to make organophosphate pesticides more effective. And we use phosphoric acid to do that. And, but as organophosphate pesticides have gone away, it's not necessarily having to do that as much. So some of the acids we use, citric acid versus sulfuric acid. Uh, this is a table from one of your handouts that is in your supplemental reading section from North Carolina. Uh, you can see that um, if we have a water treatment and we've got two milliequivalents of bicarbonate, I want to take it down to one milliequivalent to bicarbonate. That means I need to add um, this much acid into our system to bring it down to that level of bicarbonate. I'm not going to take all the bicarbonates out. One, because it costs too much money. Two, I'd like to have a little bicarbonate in my system as a buffer.